Okay, this video is for the 320 course and we're going to talk about factoring. So when it comes to factoring, there are essentially three steps, okay? So step one is to always factor out the greatest common factor. Step two is to factor according to the number of terms. Okay. And there's three options that we'll see in this course. And that's if you have two terms, three terms, or four terms. Now, if you have four terms, you will use the grouping technique. And sometimes may, you may need to rearrange terms in order to do the grouping technique. If there are two terms, there's a series of formulas that you'll have to use if they apply. And we'll talk about those once we talk about uh, factoring uh, expressions with two terms. Or if you have three terms. Now, if you have three terms, there's two situations you can have. You can have a coefficient of 1, or you can have a coefficient that is not equal to 1. Okay? Now, if your coefficient is equal to 1, um, we will apply the same technique here and here. However, once you find what's called the magic numbers, this one is a little bit easier to factor with the magic numbers, whereas this one requires what's called the AC method. And that means after you get the magic numbers, you'll have to turn the problem into a grouping problem, okay? So again, all of these things we'll discuss further um, in some examples that I have provided. The third step will be to be sure every factor is factored completely. This means just because you factored something out doesn't mean what you have remaining cannot still be factored. So if what you have in any set of your parentheses still has a GCF, you must factor that out. If it has one of these types of terms and you can apply the formulas or these techniques or a grouping technique, you must keep applying them. So even though you've done some factoring, in some very rare cases do you have to continue to factor. And that will be one of the last examples that we go over. Okay, so let's build upon this. So the first thing I want to cover is just how do you factor out a GCF. So if you have it not matter how many terms, whether you have two terms or three terms or five terms. Essentially what you're doing is you're considering what number can I divide all of these terms by and how many letters can I take from all of these terms here. So between 20 and 15, 5 is the factor that they would have in common. Between y squared and y, they only have one y in common. This term does not have y squared, therefore I could not use y squared as my common factor. So then what happens with these terms? Any thing that you determine is your GCF will come outside of a parenthesis. And then if you need to have help determining what should go inside the parenthesis, all you need to do is divide each term by what you decided they had in common. And if they do in fact have that in common, then there should be no problem dividing by this particular term. So 20 divided by 5 is 4. y squared divided by y is y. 15 divided by 5 is 3. And y divided by y actually cancels. So I literally just have 5 y and 4y minus 3 in parentheses. 
And that is the final answer. Other than closing the parentheses a little bit sooner, this will be the final answer. For my second example, we have 5y cubed minus 3y squared plus 25y minus 15. Now again, you would always go through those same three steps that we discussed earlier. So one, is there a greatest common factor among all four terms? And the answer is no. There's no number that will divide evenly into 5, 3, 25, and 15. And this term does not have a y, therefore they cannot have any all y's in common. So since there's no greatest common factor, we move on to the second step. The second step says that I need to factor according to the number of terms that I have. And the number of terms that I have here is 4, which means for 4 terms I need to be applying my grouping technique. In the grouping technique, you group the problem in half. So the first half and the second half. Now remember that this plus sign belongs to the 25. That's why I drew my line to the left of the plus sign because these two terms need to be off to the right. Now you just look at each side of this red line as its own little problem like example one. So if I just look at 5y cubed, what do those two terms have in common? They don't have a number that they are both divisible by, but they can both be divided by y squared. And when I divide them both by y squared, I end up with 5y minus 3. For the second half, cover that up. Only thing different here is that whatever sign you have here, it must come down. And then you decide what do these two terms have in common. Well, both of those terms can be divided by 5, but no y's because this last term does not have a y to divide by. So I have a positive 5 that I need to divide both terms by. When I do that, positive 25 divided by positive 5 is positive 5 and the y carries on. Negative 15 divided by positive 5 is a negative 3. Then you look at the whole problem holistically again. So now you're looking at the left side and the right side together as a whole. Does the left side and the right side have anything in common? They do. They have this 5y minus 3 in common. And if you were to factor that 5y minus 3 out, what would be remaining? You would have y squared plus 5 remaining. And so that's what goes in the second set of parentheses. And this is the factored version of what we had. And you can always check your answers. I didn't cover this in example one, but remember what factoring is. It's basically figuring out what were the two items that you multiplied together to get the expression you were given. So if I want to check my answer for example one, all I have to do is multiply that out and see if I get what I was given. So if I were to multiply this out, the process for multiplying a monomial times a binomial is to distribute. So if I distribute 5y and 4y, I get 20y squared. And if I were to distribute 5y times negative 3, I would get negative 15y. This does in fact equal the original problem I was given. Therefore, I have factored it correctly. Same thing goes for example 2. If I want to know if this is correct, I just need to multiply it out. Well, the rules or the steps for multiplying a binomial times a binomial is to distribute, okay? So each term in the first parentheses will get distributed to the terms in the second parentheses. So I will do 5y times y squared and then 5y times y. I get 5y cubed plus 20 5y. 
Then I will take the negative 3 and distribute it to both of these terms. So first I will get negative 3y squared, then I will get negative 15. Is this expression equivalent to what I was given? I have the 5y cubed, I have a positive 25y, I have a negative 3y squared, and I have a negative 15. So even though they're in a different order, this expression is still equivalent to the expression I was given. Therefore, I have in fact factored it correctly. So here's another example of factoring by grouping. Now again, the first step I should be doing is seeing if all the terms can be divided by a certain uh, expression. None of these numbers, 5, 3, 25, and 15, can be divided by the same number. They can all be divided by 5 except for this guy. So he's, that's an issue. And they all have a W except for this guy which means they don't have anything in common among all four terms. So I cannot factor out a greatest common factor. So the next step is to count how many terms I have, and I have four terms, which tells me I need to group. So I'm gonna cut this problem in half, but remember that minus sign belongs to that 25. So when I cut it in half, it gets cut in half there. Now the left two terms only have a W squared in common, and when I divide by w squared on both terms, here I will get 5w, and here I will just end up with a 3. On the right-hand side, again, we must bring this symbol down. And these two terms can both be divided by 5. However, outside of my parentheses is actually a negative 5 because I brought down that minus, which means when I do the division here, I should actually be dividing by negative 5. So negative 25 divided by negative 5 is a positive 5, and the W carries on. A positive 15 divided by a negative 5 is a negative 3. Then both sides of the line have this 5W minus 3 in common. And if I were to factor that out, what I'm left with is w squared minus 5. And so therefore, I believe I have factored it correctly, and these are my factors. Again, if you want to check it, just multiply it out. So 5w times w squared is 5w cubed. 5w times negative 5 is negative 25w. Negative 3 times w squared is negative 3w squared, and negative 3 times negative 5 is positive 15. And just verify that all your terms are the same. Positive 5w cubed, check. Negative 3w squared, check. Negative 25w, check. And positive 15, check. So this expression is equivalent to our original, even though it may have the terms in different order, okay? Therefore, my answer is correct. I could submit it in Alex, and I would be getting my full credit for it. Here's another example. So I am going to write this problem again, only because if I follow what I've been doing before, you might notice something. So first I would check to see if there's a greatest common factor, right? And since this does not have a number in front, I couldn't possibly divide by the same number. And since this term does not have any x's in it, I couldn't have x as my common factor. And these two terms don't have any w's in them, so I couldn't have w as my common factor. So since there's no common factor, we're not going to be factoring out a greatest common factor. However, 
we will still continue with the process. So I do have four terms. So I should be attempting to factor by a grouping method. Uh, method. These two terms have an x in common. And if I factor the x out, I have 24 minus w. Here, bring down my minus sign. These two terms can both be divided by two, but they don't have any variables in common. So I'm gonna divide by negative two, divide by negative two, I get positive two x squared and a negative three w. But you'll notice what is in this parentheses does not match what's in that parentheses, like they have been on the grouping technique. This causes a problem, which means that my terms may just need to be rearranged, okay? Now normally the way I like to rearrange them is I like to look at my coefficients and put them in descending order. So my first coefficient here is 24, so I'm gonna have to have 24 first, the whole term though, 24x, then the next highest would be 6, so 6w. The next highest would be the 4 minus 4x squared. And then the next highest would be um, the 1, which would be just xw. Now if I apply my grouping technique, I can factor out a 6 from both of these terms. And if I do that, I will get 4x plus w. Here I will bring down my minus and I can factor out an x from both of these terms. So if I divide each term by a negative x, a negative and a negative will give me positive 4x. Negative x and negative x will cancel, leaving me with positive w. Now notice what's in the two parentheses does match this time. And so what I have left over is the six and the minus x. And this is factored correctly. And if you foil it out, you should have all four of those terms. Another way of grouping these so that you can still work with it is to take the highest exponent instead of the highest coefficient. So the term with the highest exponent would be negative 4x squared. Then the next exponent for x would be just 1. But I have two terms where x to the power 1. Now, then I have to go and I have to look at this other term. Does this other term have something in common with this term? Or does it have something in common with this term? It actually has something in common with both. So I could factor out a six if I were to use this one, or I could factor out a w if I were to use this one. So and in that case, it really wouldn't matter which one I chose to write next. Okay, however, if for instance, this was not a 24, if it was something else, then I would probably want to have the two items with the W in the back and then this item in the middle. Okay, that's just an example. But for our case, it really wouldn't matter. I could put the positive 24X, then the minus XW, and then the plus 6W. And so if I group them again, here, you never like to have a negative in front, so I would always have to factor out that negative. So I have to bring that sign down, just like you have to bring this front one down. You have to bring this front one down. And these can both be divided by four, and they both have an x in common. So this time, I'm actually gonna be dividing by a negative four x. When I do that, I'll get a positive one x. Here, I'll get a negative six with no more x's. If I bring this minus down, they have a w in common, and if I divide both terms by a negative w, I will get a positive x and a negative 6. Then you'll notice that what they have here matches, and I get negative 4x minus w. Now believe it or not, these two things are exactly the same. I shouldn't say the word exactly. They are equivalent to another, okay? It may not look like it, but they are, okay? The only difference is, is, if I were to take either one, okay? But if I were to take them and the term, the factor with the negative in it, a minus, if I factor out a negative one and then distribute that negative one to the other factor, 
I will get the other version of itself. So let's start with this one. This one has a minus. So if I were to factor out a negative one from there, this would become divide by negative one, that would become negative six, divide this guy by negative one, that would become a positive x. So then if I rearrange these, I actually have negative one times x minus six. This is the same as this factor here. So if I rewrite it, I could put that in the front and then put the 4x plus w in the back. And this is what I get for this expression. So this expression can also be written like this. Now, if I do the same thing here, where I have two minuses, if I factor out the negative one, I would divide this by a negative one, which would make it positive 4x. I would divide this by a negative one, which would make it a positive w. And remember the commutative property with multiplication. It doesn't matter whether I multiply a times b times c, or b times a times c, or c times a times b, or c times b times a. The product, the answer here, is always going to be the same, no matter what order they're in. So I could write that negative one in the front and then choose to write the other factors behind it. And if you notice, these are exactly the same expressions. So this is equivalent to that expression, this is equivalent to that expression, and they are equivalent to each other, which means these two things are equivalent to each other. So even though they may look a little different, they are equivalent to one another, okay? And both of these in Alex would be the correct answer. Both of them would be accepted as, a, as an answer. I just wanted you to see that when you have to regroup them, sometimes it's possible to regroup them in more than one way and still get the same answer or still get a correct answer. Okay, now I want to move on to what happens when you have three terms. So for example five, we're going to have our first trinomial. Okay, and so the idea is, remember what factoring is. It's finding what two things that were multiplied to each other that when I multiplied it, I get this expression, okay? Now, the idea is, is to take the factors of negative 36 and find the ones that subtract to give you negative 9. So this symbol right here will always tell you whether you're supposed to be adding or subtracting your factors. Okay? Not only that, this sign also tells you whether these two signs should be the same or different. If it's a positive, the only way you get a positive by multiplying two numbers is if they're the same. The only way you can get a negative by multiplying two numbers is if they had different signs, meaning one was negative and one was positive, okay? So this right here automatically tells me that one of these signs has to be positive and one of them has to be negative. Now, remember the way I phrased it. Find the factors of this guy that will add or subtract, subtract in this case because it's a minus, to get negative 9. Well, when you combine two factors that are different, right? When you combine two factors that are different, the only way you can determine your answer sign is by taking the sign of the bigger number which means that the bigger number will have to be the one with the minus. So let's go ahead and find the factors of 36. Now, eventually these numbers get really large, and so you want to make sure that you have guaranteed yourself that you are looking at a proper list. So what I do is I like to take the square root of my number, and in this case I get a perfect six. So I take my number 36 and I start going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And I want to find all the factors 
So 36 divided by one will give me 36, which means that one times 36 is 36. 36 divided by two in my calculator gives me 18, which means that two times 18 is 36. 36 divided by three is 12, so there's another pair of factors. 36 divided by four is nine, there's another pair of factors. 36 divided by five is a decimal, so this number does not work. And 36 divided by six is six. So these are all the possible combinations to multiply to give us 36. Now which of these will subtract to give us 36? I'm sorry, subtract to give us negative nine. Well, the only ones that subtract to get nine would be three and 12. When I take away three from 12, I actually will end up with a nine. Now, remember what we said about the signs. That means the signs will be different. This will be the sign of the larger number. So between three and 12, 12 is actually the larger number. Therefore, three would be the smaller number, which has to go in with the plus sign. And what times what would give me y squared? Well, y times y would give me y squared. So this should be our answer here. And always you can check. So y times y is y squared. y times negative 12 is negative 12y. Positive 3 times y is positive 3y. And positive 3 times negative 12 is negative 36. And when I combine my like terms here, I do end up getting the exact same expression that I was given at the beginning. So this does check out, and I do know that I have the correct factors. Okay, here's one more example. Very similar, but just a little bit different. Notice that I have two variables. I have a squared variable over here in the front. The only way I'm gonna get x squared is to do x times x. But in the back, I have y squared. And in order for me to get the y squared, I'm gonna have to have y and y. The only thing is, is I also need to have my um, magic numbers in there as well. So the magic numbers go in front of those y's. Now remember what we know. This means that the numbers should be adding together. And this means also that they're gonna have the same sign. And since this is the sign of the bigger one, and they're supposed to be the same, that just means that both of them are going to have a plus. Okay, so now let's do the square root of 39 to find all the factors. Well, the square root of 39 is going to be six point something. So six is what I need to focus on. So I'm gonna go down my list to six. So one times 39, 2 does not go in evenly, 3 times 13, 4 does not go in evenly, 5 does not go evenly, 6 does not go evenly. Even if they did, I would stop here only because I noticed that I'm supposed to be adding, right, my numbers, and 3 and 13 do in fact add to give me 16. So those are the numbers that I'm going to pick here, and I had already determined what the signs were, so I have a hunch that this is our answer. Again, you can check it. X times X is X squared. X times 16Y is 16XY. 3Y times X is 3XY. And 3Y times 16Y is, um, oh, I put 16, it should be 13, right? My magic numbers were three and 13. So this should be 13y, there we go. And then 3y times 13y would be my 39y squared. Now if I combine my like terms, I get x squared plus 16xy plus 39y squared, which is equivalent to the original. So we factored it just the same as we had before, except 
this time um, we had to consider that there were variables at the back, not just variables in the front. Okay. So here's example seven. Now, remember the rules. Is there a greatest common factor? That should be the first thing that I'm looking for. And there is. 2, 4, and 70 can all be divided by 2. This does not have an x, therefore I cannot include any x's in my GCF. So if I divide each term by 2, I get x squared minus 2x minus 35. And then um, now I would go back and see, do I have any, can this factor be factored more? Can this factor be factored more? A 2 cannot be factored any further. However, x squared minus 2x minus 35, although it doesn't have a GCF anymore, it can be factored using the same techniques we've done for example 5 and example 6. So we're going to take the factors of 35, and for this table, I only need to go down to 5 because the square root of 35 is 5 point something, okay? So then 1 times 35, 2 will not work, 3 will not work, 4 will not work, and we have 7. And we need to be able to subtract to get 2, okay? So I am going to put my two parentheses, x times x is x squared, 5 times 7 is 35. They do need to have different signs, and the bigger sign needs to be negative. So negative here, positive there. This is what I feel is the answer. You can always check it. Keep your GCF there and multiply the two factors. So x times x is x squared, that's negative 7x, that's 5x, and then that's negative 35. So I get 2x squared minus 2x minus 35, and if I distribute my 2, I will get 2x squared minus 4x minus 70. And this expression is equivalent to the original expression. So it does check out. Okay, now we're going to move on to the more complicated um, trinomials. So now we get into example 8. So again, first step is to see if there's a GCF. These do not have a GCF in common. However, there is a number in front here. Okay which is going to affect things. That means when I get my magic numbers, I can't just put um, x and x and then my magic number here, my magic number there. Because when I go to distribute, I'm gonna get x squared and then something in front of x and then something else in front of x and then some number, right? I'm never gonna get three x squared. I'm only gonna get just x squared. So this problem cannot be done the exact same way that we have been doing them. When you have a number in front, it's going to affect things. What happens is you take this number in front and you multiply it by the number in the back. And that will become 30. Then you do the same thing you did before to find the magic numbers, but you're using 30 for the factors and they still have to add to give me 17. So if I do 1 and 30, that won't work. 2 and 15, those will add to give me 17. So I don't need to keep going down the list. Okay. Although how far would I have to go down the list to make sure that I have all the possibilities? Well, the square root of 30 is 5 point something. So I would have had to have gone all the way down to just 5 to make sure I had every single combination. Okay. But we found the one that will add to give us 17. So you can't put it in the parentheses right away like we did before when there was no number in front. Now that there's a number in front, what we do with those numbers is a little bit different. We turn this trinomial 
into a, a polynomial with four terms. To do that, we're gonna split this middle term into two terms. Since you already know that two plus 15 will give me 17, then you're gonna split the 17x into 2x plus 15x and bring down the plus 10. And this line should be equivalent to that line. And since I have, um, I can combine like terms, I would get 17x in the middle, which means this line is equivalent to the original. Then now that I have four terms, I would graph, uh, factor by grouping. So this side has an x in common, and if I took the x out, I would have 3x plus 2, bring down my plus sign. This side has a 5 in common, and if I divide by positive 5 here and here, I would get 3x and a positive 2. So they both have 3x plus 2, and the leftovers are x plus 5. And so now I have factored it completely. And again, you can double check just by multiplying it out. So 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times 5 is 15x. 2x, 2 times x is 2x and two times five is 10. And if I combine my like terms in the middle, I get the exact same expression that I had before at the beginning. So this is in fact correct. So here we have 21y squared plus 25y minus four. So we have to do 21 times 4. That is 84. And what is the square root of 84? It is 9 point something, which means in order to make sure I have every possible combination, I would have to make my list all the way down to 9. So 1, and these have to subtract to give me 25. So the sign rule still are the same even though the number I'm using is not 4, right? So I have to subtract to get 25. So 1 and 84 does not give me 25 when I subtract. 2 and mm, 2 and 42 do not subtract to give me 25. 3 and 28, those do subtract to give me 25. Now the bigger sign has to be plus. Plus. So the bigger number sign would have to be plus. And because I have a minus here, that means these should have different signs, which means this one should be a negative. So when I split this, it should be 21y squared and a negative 3y and a positive 28y. And when I combine negative 3y and 28y, I get 25y. And then you apply the grouping method. So this side can be divided by 3, and it can be divided by y. So here I get 7 and a y. Here, the y's cancel. 3 divided by 3 is 1. Bring down the plus sign. These can both be divided by 4, and no y, because the back term does not have a y in it. So if I divide by positive 4, I get 7y, and negative four divided by positive four is negative one. The two sides have seven y minus one in common and three y plus four left over on the outsides. And so this is my final answer. Now you can multiply that out just to verify. So that seven y times three y is 21 y squared. Seven y times four is 28 y. Negative 1 times 3y is negative 3y, and negative 1 times positive 4 is negative 4. If I combine my like terms in the middle, I get positive 25y minus 4, and that is equivalent to the original, so I have factored it correctly. Okay. Now what we're going to discuss is how to factor... Um, Expressions that have two terms. So expressions that have two terms 
have to follow one of the four formulas. If it doesn't, then if, it, if you cannot take out the GCF and it doesn't follow one of these four formulas, then anything with just two terms cannot be factored, okay? So the first we have is the sum of squares. So that's if you have something squared plus something else squared. Well, in that case, this cannot be factored. So if you do see this, don't bother trying to factor it. It cannot be factored. The mathematical term we use for, for expressions that cannot be factored is the word prime. Right, just like prime numbers, we also have what are called prime expressions. So you can't factor them any further, okay? Then we have the difference of cubes. Or I'm sorry, difference of squares. So that's if you have something squared minus something squared. Well, in this case, it does factor, and it factors into a minus b, and then a plus b. So once you identify what exactly is being squared there, then it's just a matter of putting it in the front and then putting the back guys factors in the back, okay? Then we also have the sum of cubes and we have the difference of cubes. So that's if I have a perfect cube plus another perfect cube or perfect cube minus another perfect cube. So the formula is a, b, a squared, a, b, and b squared for both. The only thing that's different between the two formulas is this sign. Therefore, the only thing that's going to be different from the responses are some of the signs. So the back guy will always be positive for both formulas. The first parentheses sign should match the sign that you were given in the original. So if this is a plus sign, this should be a plus sign. If this was a minus sign, this first parentheses should have a minus sign. The second symbol, the one that's missing, should always be the opposite of the first. So if you had a plus here, your first would be plus, your second would be minus. If you had a minus here, the first would be minus, the second would be plus. But no matter what, the third sign should be plus. Okay? So now let's use these things to factor some more um, expressions. So we have 4 minus w squared. And so then I notice that this can be written as 2 squared, and this can be written as w squared, which means when I factor this, I would be putting 2's in the front of my parentheses and w's in the back of my parentheses. And according to the formula, one should have a minus and one should have a plus. And this is factored. It won't factor anymore because I've used the formula. Okay. However, you can still check. So 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times w is 2w. Negative w times 2 is negative 2w. And then negative w times w is negative w squared. And these two terms will actually cancel each other because you have positive 2 take away 2, which means you have none of those terms left over. And you do get the same expression that you had at the beginning, okay? Here's another example. So we have 49 minus 36v squared. So then we need to identify what is being squared here so that we know what to put in these parentheses. Well, for the first term, 7 squared gives me 49. So I know that a 7 will go in the front of each set of parentheses. Here, a 6 squared will give me 36, and a v squared will give me v squared. So 6v times 6v is 36v squared. So I'm going to put a 6v here and a 6v there. 
one will have to be minus, one will have to be plus, according to the um, formula. And so this would be my answer. And you can always double check it. Seven times seven is 49. Seven times positive six V is 42 V. Negative six V plus seven times seven is negative 42 V. And then negative 6v times positive 6v is negative 36v squared. Same thing as before, the two middle terms will cancel, leaving me with just 49 minus 36v squared. And that is equivalent to the original, so we have factored it correctly. Now let's go over another example. Here we have x to the fourth z squared minus four. So again, I see a square, a perfect square, and a minus. So that tells me this could be a difference of squares. So let's figure out what would be squared here and here so that we know what to put inside the parentheses. Well, two squared is four, so there's gonna be twos at the back. And then x squared times x squared is x to the fourth and z times z is z squared. So now we know what to put in the fronts. And one should have a minus and one should have a positive. And this is the end of it, okay? You can always multiply and double check. This term times this term is x to the fourth z squared. This term times two is positive two x squared z. Negative two times this is negative two x squared z, and negative two times positive two is negative four. Two middle terms cancel, and you do end up with the original expression. So this does check out. Okay, now before we continue on, um, oh, I got two more, actually. So here is example 13. We've got 6, 3v cubed minus 28v. Now this is not a difference of squares, but it's also not a difference of cubes because 28 is not a perfect cube and neither is v. So let's go back to the beginning and make sure that we factor out a GCF if there is one. Now both of these numbers can be divided by seven and both of them have at least one v. So if I divide both of these terms, I will get 9v squared minus 4. Now this part can be factored using the difference of squares. So 3v times 3v is 9v squared, and 2 times 2 will give me 4. So then this parentheses will have 3v in front, and twos in the back. One will have a minus, one will have a plus, and this is the answer. However, if we multiply that out, we will end up with 9v squared, positive 6v, negative 6v, and negative 4. These terms will cancel, but all we'll have is 9v squared minus 4. That is not equivalent to the original. So we have to remember that when we factored out that GCF, that is part of the factoring process and therefore it should be part of my factoring answer. And if I have that 7V there, then that means I still have a 7V left to distribute. So when I distribute that 7V, I'll get the 63V cubed and the 28V. And this expression is equivalent to the expression that I was given at the beginning. So just don't forget to bring down your greatest common factor. If you're checking your answers, that will be a big indicator, since you're not getting 63, like you should have, that you forgot something, and that'll kind of help you um, to remember those greatest common factors. Now I have one more example of this, and then I have something I want you to notice. So let's see, we have 2x cubed minus 2w to the fourth x cubed. So again, I have a difference, right? So I want to see if it follows any of my rules because I just have two terms. But first I need to take out a greatest common factor. 
And here, the greatest common factor would be 2 and x cubed. So if I divide both of these expressions by 2x cubed, both of these terms, I'm sorry, um, the x cubes will cancel, should be dividing by x cubed, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. Here the x cubes will cancel, 2 divided by 2 is 1, but I still have a w to the fourth left. Now this could be a difference of squares. So 1 times 1 is 1, and w squared times w squared is w to the fourth. So this will factor into 1 minus w squared and 1 plus w squared. And then I have the 2x cubed still in the front. Now notice, these have powers, which means they may still be factorable. Okay, So this is a sum of two perfect squares, which is prime. So this term cannot be factored any further. But this is a different of two perfect squares, which means once I identify what those squares are, I have to factor this term here, this factor here. So 1 and a w. w squared is w squared. 1 squared is 1. So this factor here will become 1 minus w and 1 plus w. All the other factors will stay exactly as they were since they cannot be factored any further. And this is now our final answer. So since there's no more exponents in here, those cannot be factored any further. Now, if you want to go back up here, notice we did still have exponents in there. However, we had a sum and a square, which we know we can't factor regardless. Here we have a difference and a square. But z is not a perfect square, and 2 is not a perfect square. There's no number squared that'll give me 2, and no number squared that'll give me z. So this is already in its lowest factoring possibilities, okay? Now, there's two more things I wanted to notice. Back to three terms. There's a couple of uh, topics in there that talk about perfect square trinomials. You don't really need to memorize the formulas for perfect square trinomials because they work just like regular trinomials work. So since there's no number in front, I can shortcut to get the magic numbers by just looking at four. The factors that will add to give me four are two and two. So I'm gonna have x and x, two and two. The sign should be the same and therefore they should both be negative. And then the only difference is, is to input your final answer to Alex. If these match, you just put a square, and that's what they want in Alex. So you factor it like you normally would, and if the two factors actually happen to be the exact same thing, then you just apply a square. Now the last example I have So here you would multiply 49 times 9 and you get 441. Now the square root of 441 is actually equal to 21. So I would have to go down this list all the way. I'm going. And 21. Now, since the square root of 441 is 21, what that means is that 21 times 21 should equal 441. Now, I do know that we also have this combination. 2 will not work. It could divide it by 3. I would get 147. Uh, I could keep going down the list, and I might as well. It's not going to be no big deal. It just takes a little while. It's not going to be divisible by 5 nor 6. It is divisible by 7, not 8. 
it is divisible by 9. It's 49. It's not divisible by 10 or 11. Or 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 so these are all the factors now the question is, which pair of factors will add to give me 42? And out of all of these, 21 and 21 are the ones that will add to give me 42. So remember, there's a number in front here. You can't do it like the previous example when there was no number in front. When there's a number in front, you have to use those magic numbers to split the middle guy up. So this will become positive 21u and positive 21u. Same sign, both positive. And then you group it. This side can be divided by 7 and u, which gives me 7u and 3. This side can be divided by a 3, which gives me 7u and 3. They have a 7u plus 3 in common, so that came out but I still have a 7u and a plus 3 left over. And notice that since they're the same, you can just write 7u plus 3 squared. Okay? And so that's really the only big difference between um, the regular trinomials, is that in these particular problems, um, they match at the end, and then you have a square. But instead of memorizing the formulas, just keep doing what you've been doing and it'll still work the same. So the next video, when we go to class next time, I'll cover a couple more factoring things um, and then we'll start hitting how to solve the equations that require factoring.